so many names on a list uh, of people joining us um, for this student symposium um, by our Greater Manchester Basswood branch. Um, I just wanted to quickly introduce myself. My name's Sarah Pollock. So I'm the chair, the very recently appointed chair of the Greater Manchester Basswood branch. Um, and there's many members of the branch committee who, who've been in the committee for much longer than I have. Um, and so hopefully um, we're going to be able to work together to bring a whole host of new things um, along to you guys. Um, I've got a bit of a survey that I'm going to share as we make our way through the presentation. So at the end of the presentations, um, just for you to all leave some feedback if you can. Um, and the feedback really is centering around what you'd like from us. Um, so what, what kind of events, if there's anything else that you think that would be useful so that we can use that to, to plan our future events um, to make sure that they're useful um, for you guys um i know we've got a whole mix of people um so it's really really good to have you all here um stacy's here with us as well stacy's our new vice chair um and she's also a student at manchester met um so we're, i'm very excited um as i'm a lecturer at, at manchester met as well um so I can see people are using the chat to introduce themselves. Um, do keep doing that, making contact with each other as well. Hopefully you'll be able to do that through the questions as well, um, because we want you to learn from each other as well as from us. Um, we've got four different talks on this evening. Um, we've got Lisa Cassidy, who's going to start us off shortly. Lisa's the Workforce Development Lead um, at Bolton Council. And she's going to talk to you guys um, about placements um, from a local authority perspective. So what kind of things you can expect. We've then got Vicky Shevlin, who is a founder of Social Work Sorted Training and Consultancy. She's going to talk about social media and how to use and consume that. Um, and there's lots of issues around that for those of you that are students. So it's really important to, to hear some of that information and think about how you can use that yourself. Then we've got the lovely Rachel Rook, um, who's one of my colleagues at Manchester Met. Um, she's also a lecturer there. Um, who's going to be joined by Mberi Chamjalo, who is uh, one of our students um, on the social work programme, and P Pam Shodin, who is a social worker. Um, and Rachel and Pam are also members of the Black and Minority Ethnic Professionals Symposium at Baswa as well. So they're going to talk a bit about that and a bit about um, placements from an academic perspective. So thinking about that written work and that academic work as well. And then finally, we're going to um, end with Denise, who is our Baswa Professional Officer, and she's going to give a bit of information and talk to you guys about what Baswa can offer um, our students um, and what supports available through um, Baswa. So hopefully you'll be able to stay for all of it. Um, I know some of our um, committee members are introducing themselves in the chat as well and that's really great um, and Stacey is going to end our evening this evening um, because this event was her idea really um, so without Stacey we wouldn't be having this symposium so we, we can thank her at the end for that. Um, so I will now hand over to Lisa. Um, Lisa do you want to share your slides? Yep. Just to uh, let everybody know, I know it's in the chat, um, but we are recording the session. So if you've joined recently, just to remember that we are recording. Um, so if you don't want to be on the recording, then don't turn your camera on. Um, and if you want to ask a question, but you're not comfortable with um, speaking on the camera, so if you don't want to be on the recording, you can ask that question in the chat and we'll keep monitoring that as well. Um, and we'll remind you of that after each of the each of the talks, just in case anybody new joins us. Um, but over to you, Lisa. Thank you very much. Can you see the slide? Yes. Ah, perfect. So I'll start. So my name's Lisa Cassidy, and I'm the social work learning and development lead in Bolton. But I'm here today, really representing Greater Manchester Social Work Academy and the ten local authorities. Uh, in Greater Manchester, but actually I just from looking at the chat, I can see that the students here from all over 
the country really so this this doesn't matter this isn't just about greater manchester this is general it's just that i'm representing greater manchester um so i think the first thing i want to say is is welcome in terms of placements, the local authorities really want to welcome you to those placements, whether it's first or final year. And it's not just the local authorities, is it? It's any of the organisations that you arrive on placement because you are our future recruitment resource. So we really, really want you to join us. And there's something about us making a good impression to you and really looking after you and supporting you on placement. But there's also something about you making a good impression as well. Because if you are interested in working in that particular setting, in that local authority or that organisation, you're starting, aren't you, right before you even arrive when you've done your placement application at, at demonstrating who you are. And that's our first sight of you. So I kind of want to start by talking about your placement application. So I know some of you are on placement, you might be in final placement, you might be at the end, but those of you who are going to be doing a placement application, it's really important that you spend a lot of time on it because that's our first impression of you. So I want to spend a little a bit of time talking about that. And it will also help you in terms of when you start applying for jobs as well, because the same principles apply. Uh, so our role for you in terms of looking after you and supporting you, if you're on final placement, it's about us getting you job ready, isn't it? It's about us making sure by the end of that placement, you are ready to start your first job as a newly qualified social worker and go for those interviews. And if you're on your first placement, it's about us getting you ready for that final placement. So when you're thinking about doing your placement application, there is always an area on it where you're talking about what you've done before, what your experience is and what you've got to offer that placement team or that organisation. And the potential practice educator wants to know about you. They just want to know who you are, what you've done, what experience you've got, what skills and knowledge and values you hold. And it's really important that you get it on that application form. So you need to clearly evidence your previous experience and on the application form, start to make parallels between your current skills and knowledge and what you want to learn, as well as quite trying to make your enthusiasm and interest come through in the application. And generally, when students spend a lot of time on that form and really go to town on it, that enthusiasm comes through. So that when the practice educator receives your application straight away, they're thinking this person looks amazing. We really want them in our team. We can teach them loads. And you know what? That this person might come and work for us. So even better. So what I'm suggesting you do when you are doing that application or even when you're applying for a job, think about it in terms of the STAR method so that when you're completing your application, you're, what you're doing is you're talking about your previous experience, you're talking about your previous placement and you're giving examples of what you've done before. And a really good way of doing it is following this process. So you start with maybe giving an overview of, of, the, of the last placement or the experience you've had before. And you're going to come up with three or four examples where you can really show what you did. So you would start with the situation, you'd move through to the task, then the action and then the result. So an example might be where you've worked alongside an individual where you were asked to make an assessment of their needs and it might have been a really informal assessment. It might have been that you were just in a day service setting, you were asked to get to know somebody, but in the very nature of that you were doing an assessment. And so the situation would be where you explained who you're working with and why, where it was, what was the context and what was your role within that organisation so that the reader has a as a as a an initial understanding of where you were and what you were doing. And then you'd move through to your task. So what were you asked to do in terms of that assessment and what was your responsibility? And then the action would be what you did, what steps you took, how did you break down any barriers and develop a relationship, 
what was the assessment process you used and then the result would be the outcomes and the learning and how this would look in the general area of social work that you are now looking to go into so that the reader can see what you've done before and how then this links and parallels over into the area of practice that you're hoping to move into. Now, if this is your first placement that you're doing your application for, it might be that you haven't had any paid work before, but everybody's had experiences in life, haven't they? Everybody's done things and, and got involved in things that actually, when they think about it, they can show how they've drawn on some of their knowledge and their skills and their values. So it might be that you've had um, a job in a shop or a store, or you've been involved in something where you can really break it down and demonstrate how those links can be made in terms of social work practice. So what I'm saying to you is this is the first point of contact that that practice educator or that organisation is going to have with you. So really go to town on that application. And just to say, and most of you will know this, that the, the practice educator, the person who's receiving that application and who will be supporting you through your placement has a really important role. And it's a really skilled role. And I think the training to be a practice educator is, is very um, thorough. Uh, it takes a long time to get there. You've got to have at least students to move through that process and they play an integral role in signing off your qualification as well. So they're assessing you on placement from start to finish. They're observing you. They're giving you reflective supervision. They're supporting you. They're finding you work opportunities. They're sorting out your induction, preparing the team. And it's their role then to assess you as you move through that process. And whilst they have that responsibility of, of passing you or failing you, they will be communicating that with that uh, through that process with you as you move through your placement. So you should always know how you're doing. And if you don't ask in supervision, ask the question, am I doing OK? Am I doing well? Is there anything I should be doing differently? So that's their role to make sure that you have a really good practice experience and then you're ready if it's a final placement to move through to thinking about that job. And the informal visit that takes place prior to starting placement with the practice educator is a, is a very important time when you would prepare for that visit, you'd think about what the placement was, what you might need to know, what you might need to read about and think about before you go and have that conversation so that you feel confident about the questions that you might ask as well and the things you might need to share with your potential practice educator. And that might be about sharing backgrounds and experience, talking about the, the role of the team, talking about practical arrangements, anything you think that person might need to know if you've got caring responsibilities or you, you've got a particular start and finish time that you need to discuss, possible homeworking, all sorts of issues like that you would talk about in that informal visit so that then you both have an opportunity to think through what the placement will look like for you. And then your role on placement. Um, we, I can talk, I can speak for the whole of, of Greater Manchester, the 10 local authorities and the four universities that we really want you to have a positive experience on placement. We want you to enjoy it. It's a perfect opportunity for you to use that organisation to get the most out of it. And I've just met with some students in Bolton today who were looking at applying for jobs. And I was saying to them, while you're with us, ask questions, ask about going out and shadowing. What do you need to know in terms of the job you might want to go for? What can we do for you? So make the most of that time that you're with us. Um, there's something about taking responsibility for your own learning and being committed and open to new ideas. So this is about your placement and your learning. So there's no, it's no good getting to the end of the placement and thinking, oh, I wish I'd done this or I wish supervision had been better. I wish I'd been able to have those reflective conversations. So what I'm saying to our students in Bolton is, you need to take some responsibility. You need to take charge. This is your placement. So if it's not going well, find out who you need to speak to, who can support you. 
Make sure you know when direct observations need to be happening. Make sure you keep up to date with your portfolio um, and really take some of that power and control within that process because whilst the practice educator does hold a lot of that power you're also in a really good position that you're a student and you're there to learn and it's the perfect time to ask questions check out scrutinize uh, observe shadow co-work and, and make the most of that opportunity um, I also say to students, be honest and open with your practice educate throughout the placement. If you've got any issues or concerns, share them and be humble. You're on placement to learn. So if you're getting feedback, even if you don't agree with it all, take that feedback, accept it and use it as much as you can, because this is your time, isn't it? The only time you're going to get when you're purely there to learn, you're not being paid like you will be when you're a newly qualified social worker, you are there just to learn. And whilst, yeah, we will be asking you to do work for us, won't we? We also expect you to take that opportunity to make the most of it and get what you can out of us, really. Um, OK, so in Greater Manchester, we have our Greater Manchester Social Work Academy that I'll just quickly touch on. And we have a robust training programme for practice educators, masterclasses. And we're now developing a series of masterclasses for students. Um, and at the moment, we've got one on reflective uh, supervision. We've got one about looking after yourself. Uh, there's a, I think there's three on the programme and, and the link is there. So if you go into it, you can find the opportunities that, that are around for picking up those masterclasses um, and then very quickly once you've gone into your first uh, job you will start the assessed and supported year in employment so again as I can only really speak for Greater Manchester but all the employers use it and I think across the country most 99% of employers for social work are using and following the ASYE programme, the Assessed and Supported Year in Employment for newly qualified social workers. So it's a 12 month programme, it's governed by Skills for Care and it's across adults, children and mental health. And it, it gives us as employers a practical expression of how we are going to support and nurture you in your first year of practice so that you can develop your skills and become the competent, confident practitioners that we want you to be. You will receive frequent regular supervision that encourages rec critical reflection. You will get protected development time. You will get a reduced caseload and you will generally get mentor support as well in some guise so that you have got that that opportunity for that reflective space and, and, and discussion as you move through your first year. Uh, there is a portfolio of evidence. We're not very imaginative in social work, are we? So it's very, very similar to your final placement. You will um, you will do, I think it's, if we're, if everybody's following the new skills for care paperwork, it's two pieces of, of in-depth reflection, three direct observations, pieces of feedback from professionals and service users, um, and you have review meetings as you move through the process. So it is very well supported and it is that time when and you continue on your learning journey. And I know that in Bolton, when we're working with our newly qualified social workers, it's about also saying we want to grow you. We want you to stay with us. We want you to stay with us till you become director. That's that's the idea. What can we do for you in terms of progression and development? And I think most of the other employers are really looking at how we retain you and uh, and invest in you. Um, the uh, Right, OK, just very quickly, it's a pass or fail recommendation. It takes 12 months, but in certain circumstances, that period can be lengthened if you are having difficulties or problems. But generally, people complete the programme and I've never known anybody not complete it. So let me come back to you now. I can find you. Um, to share. Stop sharing. OK, sorry if I went over there. 
No, that was perfect okay. timing, Thank Lisa. You. Well done. You said you timed it perfectly and you have done well done. I think done. I talked at some speed though. So This is why recording things is good. Yeah. <laughs> so anybody that's here can go back and listen again if they want to. Um, so I'm just going to open out to questions now. I know we've got people from sort of all over the country by the looks of things. Um, there we go. Jen has asked our first question then. Um, what written work is expected during the ASYE year, Lisa? OK, so we do have. Um, I can I can really only speak for Greater Manchester because we're using we're all using the skills for pep, uh, care paperwork. However, that has been rolled out across across the country. And what skills for care is saying is they want all employers to use that paperwork. So I think generally we all are. And within that, there's two pieces of critical reflection, which is around around 2000 words. But actually what I say to people is don't worry too much about the word count. It's more about the reflection. So what you're doing is you're talking about a piece of work that you've done and you're reflecting on it. And there are three direct observations as well as you move through the programme where there is reflection within it. So I think at first sight, when you look at the paperwork that you're asked to complete, it does look like there's a lot of it. But when you actually look at it in detail, it's not that bad and you will have support to complete it. You will have an assessor and a mentor to guide you through. So once you've done your final placement, it will feel a bit like more of the same, but it's because that learning journey continues. Absolutely. And it continues on after ASYE and into What's your CPD it? as well. So it's just a really good routine to get into. Um, Kelly's asked a question here in the chat as well. Is she right in thinking that the voluntary or independent sector won't offer ASYE as a rule? And would that impact you negatively if you then applied for statutory work in the future? So no, it wouldn't. <laughs> it, I don't, it, well, sorry, Den Denise, you've got your hand up. Do, do you want to answer that? Oh no, I've got a question for you, Lisa. Oh, right. <laughs> I thought you were going to I can answer that if needs be though. <laughs> What I would have said is that it, it's very difficult to answer on behalf of the whole of the PVI sector, but I think some organisations do where they quali where they um, recruit uh, qualified social workers. Yes, many do offer the ASYE programme, but actually, no, it wouldn't go against you. So if you've been in a social work role and it hasn't been offered, there is that does not get in the way. It's just that it's a really useful programme to do. And for a lot of local authorities, it is part of their progression process as well. And part of moving up the, the salary scale too. So, but no, it wouldn't go against you. So you don't need to worry about that. No, so it might mean that you have when you do come to work for a local authority, you would then do it if you wanted to continue progressing. You you may do, it depends on that employer, really. Some might say oh, it's really good for you to do it, we'll put you through it. And others might say oh, we've got something equivalent that might be better. So yeah. Denise, do you want to ask your question? Yeah, um, and just I suppose it's a watch this space in terms of, of that particular question um, for children and families, because obviously the early career framework, once that's rolled out, then potentially it could have an impact. Um, and that has been a concern that Baswell has raised um, in terms of the consultation around the early career framework, because if you have to have completed your ASYE, you've got to have gone through um, those two stroke five years, depending on what they finally settle on. Um, potentially, if if your career predominantly started out outside of local authority, child protection, social work um, in children and families, then it could have an impact. But that's not where we are now. So the answer is, as Lisa said for now, but just, just keep your eye on that one. Yeah, um, yeah quick question for me. Just in terms of, um, so I support the mentoring service for Baswell and I always get asked the question when people have newly qualified and they're, they're looking for roles and there are social workers out there who are desperately struggling to get responses to the applications they're putting in. Um, and so obviously we're, we're supporting with that. But I think sometimes people are looking for roles where they think it's going to state within that advert uh, that we are offering ASYE and actually some of what I kind of say to people is it might not be that clear and actually where there's a contact name for somebody to get in touch with 
always make contact before you either put your application in or before you start down that interview process because actually it some local authorities just don't I'm going to say just don't think to actually make that really clear at that outset and so people then kind of take from that well if it's not mentioned it must mean they're not offering it and aren't then applying so it's it's I suppose it's just about everybody being aware kind of of ask the question if, if it's not quite clear yeah, that's that's a good point. And I think the other thing just to say as well is that uh, basic grade social work jobs might not stay on them. This is open to newly qualified social workers, but generally they are unless it says they're not, unless it says we want you to be two, three years post qualified. Most jobs that you will see on greater jobs or wherever you're, you know, whichever part of the country you're in will be open to newly qualified social workers. So don't don't let that put you off. Absolutely, yeah. Um, you've got to be in it to win it, um, yeah. haven't you? So you've got to try <laughs> um, for those jobs and you just never know. Um, so our next speaker is Vicky Shevlin. Um, so oh, Stacey, you've got your hand up. Sorry, can I just say, um, Julia Ross, Basware Chair, has just um, joined us as well. I invited Julia at a different um, student event and she was really excited to come and um, see what we're doing for students at Great Manchester. So I'm just letting everyone know that she is here and we are welcoming her. So hi, Julia. Oh, lovely. That is good to hear. Um, it's good that she's come to attend. Or maybe she'll be able to say something at the end. Um, not to put her on the spot. I think she's just <laughs> temporarily left her screen. <laughs> yeah, I think she's just yeah. wandered off her screen, hasn't she? Is it, um why are we talking about her? Um well we'll we'll speak we'll speak about that again, I guess. Maybe she she'll be back by the time Vicky's finished. So we'll hand over now to um Vicky Shevlin, who is going to talk about using and consuming social media. Um so Vicky's the founder of Social Work Sorted Training and Um Consulting, and no doubt she'll she'll tell you more about what that involves during her presentation. Over to you, Vicky. Would you like Thank me to you. just put a hand up? when you've got five minutes to go or do you want me to come in and tell you? Either because right. I didn't time this so hopefully I'll just be able to talk fast and get through it. Um, <laughs> can you see my screen? That's the first thing I have to check. Yes we can. Yeah but not my notes just the screen. Perfect. Not your notes just the screen. Um, so hi everyone I'm Vicky Shevlin as Sarah's already introduced. I am a social worker my background is in child protection as a social worker, a senior social worker, and as a child protection conference chair. And about two years ago, I started Social Work Sorted as an online platform for newly qualified social workers, which naturally also connects to student social workers as well. It's important because we're talking about consuming social media. You are going to consume what I'm about to present, that I tell you that this is a resource for you. This is my own views and opinions. So I'm a really proud Baswa member, but this is all me. It's not a replacement for any training, it's not affiliated with anyone, and it's not peer reviewed. And I'm going to talk about the importance of me mentioning that a little bit later on. So why am I talking about social media for students? Like I said, I started my online platform on social media. It was via Instagram. I have a blog, I have a podcast. These are just some of the numbers um, that have gathered and increased over the past two years. And I'm sharing those numbers not because numbers are actually that important when you think about social media, but hopefully to give you an indication of the input I have had to have to get the output of these numbers. It means, and I didn't even want to work out the time, it means I've spent a significant amount of time on social media, creating social media, consuming social media, and noticing the trends and the changes that have happened, particularly within social work, over the past couple of years. Um, so that's the reason why I'm sharing those numbers to say that, you know, it's all my opinions, it's all things that I've observed, but it has been because a lot of time has been put into this and why I'm so passionate about it. So when we're talking about social media, it's media that allows people to communicate. So that could be Instagram, it could be Facebook, LinkedIn, TikTok, X, Twitter, there's blogs, there's online magazines that social, social workers can access, there's podcasts as well. So it covers a range of different things and all this is also within the Basworth social media guidelines as well. We're going to start with using social media. 
and I could talk all day about it, but I wanted to break it down into three questions that I would like you to think about if you are a student social worker. What am I sharing? Who am I sharing it for? And who could be harmed by this? Now, when I am talking about this, I'm referring to accounts that are public because again I've seen a massive increase in the amount of social media accounts specifically on Instagram but on, in other areas as well where student social workers are sharing public accounts so these are accounts that can be accessed by anybody and if I share anything within this training uh, that you connect with or even leaves you feeling a bit uncomfortable please feel called in not called out this is about learning and reflection it's about getting curious so when you think about what you are sharing, if you are sharing something, are you referring to a service user without consent? So that might look like you saying, you know, on placement today, I worked with a parent who did X, Y and Z. Think about the examples that you're using if you're creating content to educate. The second thing I want you to really think about is the ethics behind recording things like a day in the life of a social worker, because this kind of content exists on TikTok, on Instagram, on YouTube, and examples I've seen within the last week or so. You know, today I supported a young person in court. Today I visited these children in foster care. Are we really unpicking the ideas of ethics when we're sharing things like that, even if we believe that we're sharing them anonymously? I have seen um, images shared that could be identified as, you know, particular areas. I have seen images shared where I could identify the name of a court. I have seen images shared that could be identified uh, where they might be secure placements. Um, so really think about the data that you're sharing and how you are sharing it and who can access it as well. And finally, think about whether your organisation knows that you are sharing or who you are checking in with because a lot of the accounts that I see and a lot of them are anonymous as well we'll talk about the problems with that later and um, I don't know if those things have been okayed by a placement coordinator by a university supervisor so really start on picking those things if you are starting to share the next thing is to think who am I sharing it for social media defines success and connection with metrics likes saves shares comments it's all about validation um, and it's really important to think why you are sharing something is it to help other social workers is it for your organization or is it for your gain or is it for your ego and again this is about being curious and um, when i started on social media i didn't know what i was doing so i didn't have an instagram account before i wanted to write a guide for social workers i wanted to connect with social workers about that and so I thought the best way to do that was through memes, because when you went on social media, all you saw about social work was memes. So images with these sarcastic comments underneath. And after a while, that started to sit really uncomfortable with me because it wasn't what I wanted to portray. It was not actually what I think social work is about. And I actually started to see some really dangerous trends in that. So really think about what you are doing and who you are sharing it for. Finally, thinking about who could be harmed by this. What does it really look like when we use people as content? Like I said, public accounts can be reached by anybody. That can be children, young people, parents, carers, foster carers, anybody working with a person. And really thinking about what does that harm look like? You know, if I share an article with a poem in and I say that this poem was inspired by a family that I worked with, what is stopping any child or young person reading that and thinking, I wonder if what I share with my social worker is going to be turned into a poem that's shared publicly over the next few years. You know, breaching consent can have those emotional consequences, but it can also have, like I've said with photographs, huge physical consequences for people. And then there's the issue, the impact on the perception of social work as a whole, especially in child protection. We work on, we try and work on a basis of trust. It's coming back to those ideas. Who could I potentially be harming? And then how can we assess harm if accounts are anonymous? I've had an anonymous account before where I didn't share my name because of the work that I was doing. I didn't want to breach confidentiality. But if I had shared a really harmful view about parents who are victims of domestic violence and I, no one knew my name, how could I be held accountable for that? And what impact would that have in my practice? And these are all things that are happening at the moment that we need to be aware of.
Final reminders, I'm trying to go all the way through, Sarah might need a little like chat on the time, um, but get curious, ask somebody about what you are sharing and always refer to the Basworth social media guidelines as well and mainly think before you post. The next thing that I want to come on to is consuming social media and the three questions that I think are really important to think about is who created it, what do I get from it and who benefits from me consuming. The first thing to think about and it's probably quite strange for me to say because but I create content to be consumed so I would like to ask you to think critically about me <laughs> include me in your thoughts when you're thinking about this because I would like to be under the same scrutiny that I'm asking you to think about for everybody else so when you are consuming something do you know who'd created it um like I've just mentioned there are anonymous accounts, there are social workers who are writing under pseudonyms, under different names. And the example that I gave before, if I'm a social worker and I'm sharing a really dangerous view about victims of domestic abuse and maybe the way that we should blame them for harm that comes to their children, a really binary view without any context. If nobody knows who I am and I'm going into practice the next day working with victims of domestic abuse, what does that mean for them? What does that mean for my practice? So if you are consuming something, think about, do you know who is writing this? Do you know who's talking? Do you know who is creating it? Because that's going to tell you something about whether you can trust it or listen to it or not. The next thing is to think about how they're packaging their content. Are they saying that it is an exclusive piece of information? It's the only information that you should listen to. I reached out to Basla when I was creating things and I was advised to actually change some of my language and talk about what I do as a resource because a resource is one of many. So think about what people are referring to. Think about, like I said at the start, nothing that I do is peer reviewed. And now you will see that across anything that I do, it's particularly around podcasting, because it's important for people consuming it to know that it's not peer reviewed. And it is all my opinion that they should think critically about it like they think about everybody else. And that final question, how can a person take responsibility for what they create? Can you get in touch with them if there is an organisation producing articles, information, blogs, who is behind that? Can you contact them? Can you make complaints? Can you raise that? It's all important when you're thinking about what you consume. The second thing to think about is what do I get from it when I'm consuming whatever this piece of social media is? A lot of the time we might consume for education. We might consume because we want to gain knowledge, new ideas, new perspectives, and that's all really positive. But a lot of the time and a lot of the student social workers that I come into contact with, they find that they are so overwhelmed with information that they actually start to feel stress and anxiety and panic and overwhelm. And a lot of that will come from the what you choose to click on. Think about how does this make me feel when I read it, when I see this headline? Does it make me feel positive about social work? Does it make me feel toxic positivity? Actually, that someone's saying everything's amazing. It's not. Or does it make me lose faith completely in the profession, make me feel really down about things, make me feel like things are really hopeless? None of those things are helpful when you are a student and when you have so much choice about what you consume. So start to ask yourself those reflective questions. The final thing that I want you to think about is, and again, I'm being really honest, is thinking about who benefits from me consuming. So I am a small business, technically a sole trader, and I try to instill my social work values in everything that I do and I share. I share lots of knowledge for free. I want it to be accessible. But if you click on something that I create, I will benefit from that in some way. It might not be a financial benefit, but it will benefit my reach. So my intention is to get you to click on things. And there's different ways people can do that. I'm talking about this because, like I said, all I, I don't advertise, I'm, I'm what I do is, is so small. But if it was bigger, my business is bigger, if I was getting loads of clicks, I could go to an organisation and I could say, look at all these social workers clicking on what I'm creating. Um, I would take that data to a particular company and I would say, hi, would you like to advertise on my page? I'm talking about this, not particularly passing judgment, that's the way lots of businesses work and function, but I'm reminding you of the reason behind clickbait. I'm reminding you of the reason that why, when you see a controversial headline when you see something that might be that toxic positivity or something that is sensationalized there is a reason for it and you need to think really critically about it so when you're consuming something think about who does that media belong to can you trace it back do you know where it goes it shouldn't take long through somebody's website for you to find 
the organisation behind who is publishing. Think before you click. Are you feeding into this idea of clickbait? Are you feeding into this idea of sensationalism? Is this impacting your work in some way? Because I know for so many social workers, student social workers, at the end of the day, you are scrolling through, feeling really overwhelmed. The way you are feeling is going to impact what you then click and how you then feel about what you click. Final reminders, and I know I've like spoken really fast and trying to fit everything in. Social media moves really fast, faster than a lot of us can keep up with, faster than guidelines can keep up with. There are changes every single day. Try and keep aware of ways that you can keep yourself safe. Check the guidelines, the password guidelines, someone's put them in the chat already. Talk to somebody. So if you feel like you're not, you shouldn't be sharing something or you're worried about sharing something, don't just share or post it. Check with your course supervisor, check with a colleague, check with your head of, you know, whoever it is within your organisation or your university check that that is okay and in line with the policy. Stay curious, stay connected to your ethics and values. And also a reminder that although I don't want anyone to come away from this thinking, oh, I never want to use social media again, it can have a massive positive impact. And at the end of the day, if you listen to anything that Mo Gordat puts out, it's a machine and it takes in whatever we input. We can input positive things. We can use social media in positive ways. We can co-create, we can relationship build with it but it all starts from a place of awareness about how we use it and how we consume it. So thank you. I think I went a little bit over the time there, um, but they're my details if you want to get in touch with me, if you've got any questions, any reflections about the presentation today. Um, and I'm part of obviously the Greater Manchester branch, which is a lovely space. So if you're here and you're thinking that you would like to be part of it, you'd like to come along to a meeting and see what it's like, um, then you are so welcome. And I know Sarah can sort that out with emails and everything. So thank you. Absolutely. Good work, Vicky. Just one minute over, which I think, you know, pretty good. Um, <laughs> thanks very much. We'll open to questions if anybody's got any questions for Vicky about that. It was so interesting um, and really good to see both sides of social media used there. Um, so thank you. Um, and we've got, um, just to say while people might be typing questions away, that we've got... Um, a space on the survey that I'll share the link to at the end for people to add in their um, email addresses if you would like to be um, on the um, circulation list for our for our events and for our meetings. We'd we'd love to have you guys there. Um, anybody's questions coming through? Stacy, did you want to? While people are typing, did you want to welcome Julia? Um, who's returned to the screen. <laughs> Hi there, Julia. Welcome. Hi, Julia. I welcomed you before, but I think you just nipped off a second. I was just saying that I um, met you at a different Basel student um, event and invited you here. So it's really lovely for you to be here. And I know you're um, very enthusiastic about welcoming social worker, uh, students, social workers to Basel. So thank you for coming along. Oh, Jackie, you've got your hand up. Yes, uh, Vicky, um, I, I practised long before social media became anything, <laughs> but I know students used to get at the beginning in trouble for using it inappropriately. And um, as you've just been talking, it... it reminded me of when I was a manager and uh, had, we had um, some uh, particularly day settings, resource centres, where people were very constantly in touch with service users and it was far more informal than many social work settings. And I, I just get that feeling that maybe social media again you're tempted by the informality of it. Um, and that's perhaps why you have to be quite careful about your boundaries. Yeah, I, I think we we live in a time where it is normal to document everything that we do, and that is shifting into our work and our professional life. And it looks very different then when you are in a public service than, for example, if you work in a, a different kind of, of organisation where uh, you, you aren't kind of 
you don't have those those ethics and values underpinning it. Yeah, absolutely. Ja Julia, you've got your hand up. Did you want to respond to Stacey from before? Yeah, yeah, OK. Yes, I would really like to because I, I welcome exploring new means of communicating and that's what socio so social media is about. I also would like us to push the boat out a bit with being where our, uh, um, our service users are, so particularly young people. And, and if we don't do that, then we, we will lose the plot, I think, for them. So I would like to see us talking about social media a lot more um, and and uh, the people we work with benefiting from it. But I would also like us to pay a bit more attention to AI and and how we can change the way that AI operates to benefit the people who use our services. So that's really fascinating. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, you're getting some lovely comments in the chat as well, Vicky. Um, people who felt said that um, Jenna there saying that, that it's normalised her feelings, hearing um, that people do struggle with getting overwhelmed um, and lots of love for your Instagram as well. Uh, <laughs> so that's good um, good to see. Um, we'll move on very quickly if that's OK, because I'm conscious. I know that we had an incredibly packed schedule, um, so I knew we were pushing it. Um, but we'll now introduce... Um, Rachel Rook, one of my colleagues um, at Manchester Met Uni. Um, so Rachel is going to be joined by Mbere Chamjalo, who is one of our students at Manchester Met, and Pam Shodin, who is a practitioner. Um, hello, everybody. Um, they are all also members mm -hmm. of Baswa's Black and Minority Ethnic Professional Symposium as well. Um, so they're going to share um, some information about placements from an academic perspective, but also um, some information about the network. Um, so I'll hand over to you guys. Thank Take you, away. Sarah. Um, so I'll, I'll start um, and then I'll hand over to Pam and then we'll just hear from Mberry really just um, about her experiences on on placement um, and I guess any any advice that she might want to sort of share to peers to students or even actually to people who are providing services as well I think we can learn a lot from listening to the students so I'm Rachel Rook I'm a senior lecturer at Man Met so I was the um, BA placement lead for two years and just to explain for students here who uh, have not yet gone on placement. Um, the process for placements is pretty much all year round, whether it's preparing to go on placement or actually being on placement. And one of the um, things that happens be that students will be aware of, but then a lot happens behind the scenes, is um, certainly in Greater Manchester, certainly at Manchester Met and the, the other three universities in Greater Manchester, students are um, required to complete a placement application form. And this is um, a document that details um, students' demographics, but also anything um, around their sort of care and responsibilities or anything to do with a disability um, that, that we need to be aware of. Um, not so that um, we can exclude students in any way, the whole thing about placements is trying to accommodate students so that, you know, students as placements are really, really challenging. So we do absolutely everything we can to get place, students placed as close to home as possible, for example, you know, as close to where they can pick up children or to be placed where they can have hours that fit in with their other care and responsibilities. So I suppose it's just to offer that reassurance that, we would always, and every university would always try to accommodate students on placement as best they can. Um, and and in, in terms of um, in terms of you know, say a student has disabilities, you know, the reason we want to speak about that is so that we can look at how can the placement make reasonable adjustments. So we do work really, really hard, and the majority of the time, um, most students 
um, are, are are placed where they where they want to be. They get exactly what they need. What we realised, or certainly what I realised, <clears throat> as as part of um, being a placement lead, that I I would get um, I would have conversations with students from um, ethnic minorities, usually black or Asian students, um, black African students who were sort of saying that their placement experience was um, different. Um, and if we're going to be really um, blunt about it, they, you know, students were experiencing, you know, racism on placement, not feeling that they were um, part of the team, not feeling like they, they belonged in in a way that their their white British peers did. And I, around about this time, um, I joined the Basler Black Professional Symposium, which is where I met Pam. And we had um, a student voice uh, conference. We wanted to hear what this was sort of in 2020. It was after the murder of George Floyd. And we, we felt very much that we wanted to we wanted to do something. We didn't just want to sort of be tokenistic. We actually wanted to do something. And but we didn't know what that would be because we didn't know what students wanted what what our, our um, students from ethnic minorities wanted so we had um, a student voice conference and this is where the network started and what happened um, what started to happen with that network we meant we went monthly online it's been this is our third year of, of the network and the students just decide what they want it to be and what became clear is that around about the time of placements students would use it to discuss their experiences on placement and it isn't a place of negativity um, you know the students agreed that they wanted it to be aspects of it to be an open forum so um, say every three or four every three months we have open sessions where any student can attend um, and it's also a time where we can be really positive and share our experiences where students can share their experiences so whilst I remember one student um, or some students speaking very openly about you know, racism that they experienced. One, we were able to support those students in a really healthy way because we got to know them really well. But then there were other students who spoke about the allyship that they'd experienced with white students who were also on their placement, who who were really supportive of them. So a big part of, of that um, was about students supporting each other and also us as a university being able to support students so that communication was really really important but for me um it was really important to have the support from the symposium as well and having Pam's support because Pam was our keynote speaker I still I've not I've known Pam now I think for three years I've still never met her in real life and um, we just meet online um but I so I suppose I'll hand over to, to Pam now really just to talk about um, I guess the impact of the symposium and how it's, um, I mean, Pam knows, and I've already told you how it's really fed into the work that I've done on placement and actually the work that we continue to do. So, because although I'm not the placement lead, I, we still facilitate the network and we still have contact with students over the placement period. So Pam, if it's okay, I'll hand over to you um, just to talk about the, the Black Professional Symposium a bit more. Yeah, Rachel, I'm still waiting for that invite. You haven't invited me to Manchester yet. <laughs> um, hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Pamela Sedondi, and uh, as Rachel just stated, that we're um, both members of the BPS, which have been uh, an amazing space, uh, which very recently I've been um, talking a lot about safe spaces, which I personally feel is needed and very necessary. Um, particularly actually for students, because that's something as a student, it's quite a vulnerable time. And, you know, sometimes you feel a little bit lost when you don't know where to go, or who to talk to, and what's actually safe to say and what's not to say. So that's why I'm particularly pleased with what Rachel's doing uh, at Manchester Metro, because I, I have, I think I've been to about two or three now of your meetings, Twilight meetings, and just having that space to have those conversations has been, I think, really helpful. Um, so I'm just going to go very quickly about my my journey as a student and where I am now. So I'm I am now um, I've been four years in practice, which I can't believe how quickly that time has gone. Um, qualified in twenty in 2019, 
and it's it honestly it's gone so so fast and in that time um I've become a, a senior practitioner stepped down from that because it just was a little bit too hard for me especially with everything else I had going on in my personal life but uh now an advanced practitioner um and I think just going back to what Rachel was saying I the reason I've um, become quite passionate about talking about racism and how it impacts on students is because that's something I personally feel I experienced as a student um and that was how I actually became uh, involved very well I, you know how Basra comes and speaks to students about you know joining Basra and not, but that was a pivotal point in my life because without the support I had from Basra I don't think I'd have been able to navigate that very difficult time when I was going through what I was going through as a student so um when I was able to come out of that experience um I then thought about how I was going to sort of pass on a lot of what I've learned in that through that experience and obviously with this cut sort of support I had how I was you know going to use that and support other students that may be going through the same thing and then obviously the opportunity came to join the BPS so I've been using that space in the best way I can possibly do so I've written quite a few articles about um student experiences um I've also done quite a few Basra um uh, Basra conferences, student conferences, talked about placement and the experiences on placement, um, and and it has been it has been really helpful to be able to to be able to do that. Um, I know I feel quite constrained with time, and I could go on and on for the next hour. But I've just I, what I would say in terms of um, advice that I would give from my experience going back, and actually something I feel would be beneficial throughout your uh, social work journey. Um, just three points I've written down is uh, make sure that you communicate, you know, your needs prior to starting placement because, as a, you know, you should have a placement meeting. Be very clear about your needs. Don't kind of wait till things start to fall apart and then, you know, is that right in the middle of that you're trying to explain. Um, really important that, you know, that's very clear and evident that those things have been agreed. Um, journal your experiences. It's really important that you enjoy the placement that's what placement for for you to be able to go in and really take in the experience and learn and if you're struggling in any way whatsoever make sure you have a mentor somebody who can stand in gap with you so that you know those struggles could be resolved in a way that meets your needs and you know if things really really come down to it then you know try and make sure that you're with a union it's really important because when it comes down to it, having that union behind you will really make that huge difference at the end of the day. Um, so I will pass on to Mbere uh, for her to sort of speak about her experience and placement. Thank well, I just thanks for that, Pamela. I just wanted to add, just to introduce Mbere. So Mbere is a um, BA2 student, social work student on placement. Um, it was a great pleasure to go and see Mbere on placement um, yesterday. It was really nice. Um, and you, you know, you, you and you or you also you've also been attending um the the network meetings really quite regularly every single time. And I think it's just to add the importance, you know, at Manmet we have this network. I would say for any students, you know, any students, but certainly students from um ethnic minority backgrounds, there's lots of research um written by sort of Prosper to Dan, people like that, Tam Kane, about the experiences of students. So it's just to find the support in your university, a, a space where you feel supported, um, um, which and, and I think we provide that hopefully at Mamma in the network. So I'll I'll hand over to Mberry to speak about her experiences. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, I'm locked inside the room, so sorry if you hear any background noise. That's my daughter knocking on the door to get in. <laughs> I will start by saying that it is great to be on placement. It comes with its challenges and rewards. Um, I believe that the challenges um, helps one to be confident and to be able to deal with situations that might not seem pleasant. However, I believe that with this, with all the challenges that one can come across during placement, it will help students to prepare them for their future career. Um, it is a space where 
you can use your skills because all the skills and all the learning that I did in my first year and at the beginning of my second year, I am using them now in practice, which is really rewarding. Um, imagine talking confidently about the PCF, the SWAY standards, knowing how to use them um, in real life. <laughs> University is real life. However, when you're in placement, it's a different setting. It's something that you, you can have the actual feeling of what you will practice in the future. So I think that is really rewarding. Um, however, I have um, my advice to all students, but especially to black and ethnic minority, is for them to have the confidence and to speak up, even if they see something that they feel like it's a bit um, challenging to them, if they feel like something is not right, and if they don't understand anything regarding any issue, it's better always to speak up at the beginning rather than leaving it late or at the end of placement, because you might um, reflect back and say, oh, if I knew, you know, I could have spoken to my supervisor, to my PE, to my tutor. So my advice to all social work students that are on placement or about to go out on placement is to be confident as far as you know what you're doing. Um, you can um, address challenges that you come across um, professionally. Um, if you address something professionally, there is always a dialogue. Um, even with service users, there is always a dialogue because some service users as well might treat you in a way that they perceive that you, the way you talk to them, the way you speak with them. So it's always good to be professional, know that boundary. Um, On-site supervisors are there to support, tutors are there to support, and um, practice educators are there to support. In my case, I had misunderstanding that we are not like. It was nothing to do with racism or any other thing. It was actually misunderstandings that I was able to stand up and say, "I this is how I've heard it's been done. Can you please, can we kindly check into this? And then, like I say, communication is the key. If there's no understanding between um, you, the student, your practice educator or your on-site supervisor, it's going to be hard on the student. It's going to be hard on you because you might think that what you're doing is right, whereas maybe if you communicate with all the people, you will see that, oh, if I do it this way, that will be, it will be better or it will stand out. And your practice educator might be doing things that maybe things have changed because everything changes every day. All the time things change. So maybe they might not be aware of such certain changes that are happening. So you as the student in, in at uni, always looking at things, maybe you might find it easier to say, oh, I think we're doing this wrong. Can we look at it in another different way? So they are, yeah, I, I, <laughs> I believe that is the best way to communicate with whoever you think that is there to support you rather than leaving it late um and at the end of placement so to all placement students as far as you know what you do and feel confident um communicate in a professional way and then whatever worries you have just make sure that you voice them out people are there to listen there is always someone there to listen but you can't know if someone is there to listen to you if you don't voice out whatever you your worries are Thanks, Emberi. I think um, that was amazing, um, of course. Uh, I think we have used all of our time. Um, so <laughs> just thank you. Thank you so much to um, Pam um, and Emberi. That, that was really great. And thanks for listening to us. That was amazing and very well done. My heart is so full listening to your advice. Um, I thank you to all of you. Um, I didn't want to stop you. So there's very limited time for questions, but it's such an important topic. I wanted to give you 
at the, the time you needed to talk about it. So if anybody has got a question, you can pop it quickly in the chat. Or Denise has very kindly also shared the link um, to the BPS. Um, and just group. to say, Sarah, I don't mind bringing mine a little bit shorter because I'm going to be sharing my presentation anyway with a lot of the links in it. So if it opens it out for discussion, I'm happy to do a, a, a shorter little slot. Denise, has anybody got any questions? Um, <clears throat> just to say, Pam, if you know you're very welcome to come to Manchester anytime you want to. Rachel's incredibly rude for not inviting you before. And if you want to talk for an hour, you are more than welcome to come and do your own session because we'd be more than willing, we'd be more than happy to, to host you again. Um, and hear more about what you've got to say. And Rachel's just a rubbish house. <laughs> it's true. It's true. I, I would. Ju I just want to meet you, Pam. I don't actually want to give you extra work to do. So just be careful of Sarah. <laughs> <laughs> and there's always the catch. Um, but th nobody's popped a question into the chat. So um, oh, there you go. Stacy has said. You mentioned allies. What can I do as a student social worker to offer peer support in this way? So is there anything that student social workers can do to 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 support um, their colleagues as allies? Is there any advice? Um, so I think that's a really important question, Stacey. And I think one of the things I would say is if you think it is what you what you've seen or observed, then you need to say it. And I think that's the issue is that many people feel quite scared and worried about the repercussions of speaking out on behalf of another colleague who's experiencing this thing. So if it, if someone's actually if someone's experiencing something, it's always that gaslighting where people say it's in your head, but actually it is what it is. So if that's something that you recognise, actually this person is being treated differently to me, then you can actually call it out because then that makes them feel a bit more confident. Um, so I think that's something that I was talking about confidence, but that's not always easy in in reality. So having that allyship and knowing that someone's actually going to be, you know, supporting you in that way is really helpful. Yeah, if we can take a little bit of that pressure off. Um, yeah, I, I, I do think that's important, and I think I, I think the notion of allyship is really underpinned by everything that we should be. Um, imbuing as social workers anyway, whether as social work students or as social workers. Um, so I think if, if, if that's, I think I, what I would say, Stacey, and I, th I just, I think it's really great that you've asked that question. Um, I would say when you, in part of being an ally, it isn't just about, it's not a knee jerk, I just want to be a good person. And I'm not saying for a minute that's, that's how you are, but I think just listening to what Pam's saying as well, um, there are systems and cultures in place um, that have been there forever. So I think being an ally needs to become a very tangible and deliberate thing to do. Understand what you stand to lose by being an ally, because you tend to have to give up some of your own power as a, you know, as a white person or as a priv privileged person, you, you, you have to be prepared to stand on another side um, and and so it's I think it's important that there's lots written. Wayne Reed has written lots about allyship. Baswell have written lots about allyship. So I think actually one of the first things you can do is 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 read about what it what it means to be an ally, um, because I do think it's something that you have to be committed to and prepared for. Um, but I, I absolutely applaud you for asking that question and, and wanting to, you know, put yourself in that position. It's what's needed for sure. Yeah, um, I'm just throwing it in the chat as well. That allyship is leveraging your privilege to support those who suffer discrimination. So that's similar to what you're saying there. Actually, you've got to be prepared um, to, to, to lose something um in that but but hopefully to you know the, the, in the long term to gain something absolutely but it's um but it, it's um you know I, I i like talking to students about allyship because it's it, it, there's a, it, there's a lot more to it um and i think 
when you realise there's a lot more to it and are prepared, then you can be a fantastic ally. You can be a, a absolutely amazing ally. And therefore, you know, that will just contribute to your social work identity and being a, a, an effective social worker as well. So thanks for that, Stacey. Thank you to the three of you as well. Um, it's, it's been really interesting um, and important. I'm really glad that that we have the opportunity to hear that here in this in this setting as well. Um, and we'll move on to to hear from Denise, our very own professional officer um, here at Glasgow, and she's going to talk. Oh, she, Denise has there just added as well how to be an anti-racist ally. Um, which is one of Wayne's, um, I think it's one of Wayne's podcasts, I'm sure she'll tell us. Um, so I'll hand over to you now, Denise. Oh, hi, everybody, and um, thanks for having us this evening. Um, yes, yeah, so that link that I've just put in, it, I think it's actually an article uh, that was in the uh, PSW, so the Professional Social Work magazine through Baswa, but there's a link to it for uh, the AAA Chimwag, which Wayne is the host of. Um, it's a podcast which explores allyship. Um, I can't remember how many episodes there are, but it's it's worth taking a look and a listen to. Um, I'm just going to share my screen. Um, and as the 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 kind of um the last speaker this evening, I'm well aware it's been a long day for a lot of people. So I'm I'm going to try and and be succinct. Um, but I could talk about Baswa forever because I've been involved with Baswa forever. Uh, both in terms of <laughs> my previous activities when I was working for a local authority and very active with Baswa, and now as an employee. So it's something. I'm quite passionate about so yeah um I'm just going to get my presentation up uh but I think we've already put it in the chat um that ultimately uh all of these presentations will be shared so don't worry too much um I've got a resource pack at the end that um also has the links now just bear with me because it's not here we go it should allow me to present in Teams, which should be a little bit easier because I'll be able to see everybody then. So just give me two seconds. Joy of technology, we love it. It's doing the little flashy thing at me, so something is happening. Just give it a minute and it will come up. Here we go. OK, so can everybody see that? Yep, grand. You've got my contact details there. They're in the chat as well. Um, but Baswa, for anybody who doesn't know, I'm going to really quickly try and describe the difference. OK, so what we've got, we've got the British Association of Social Work. That's a professional organisation with over 22,000 members across the four nations of England, Northern Ireland, Wales and Scotland. And we're a member led organisation. So in, in essence, we are independent because we do have membership fees. But that means that we are because we are independent, we're not um, relying on government funding, funding from advertisers, etc. in order to, to exist and, and to carry out our activities. It means we have got that level of independence and autonomy, which is very good at times because it allows us to challenge, challenge the narrative around social work, challenge the situations that social workers find themselves work, living in, uh, working in and also challenge some of the, the systems that the people we work with are having to survive at the moment. Um, so in terms of Baswa, we have lots of activities. I'll touch on some of our campaign activity. That's the professional organisation, OK? But we do also have a union. So we've got the Social Work Union and that's a separate organisation. We are affiliated, we work closely together on certain areas, but they are a separate organisation and we have two separate membership fees. A lot of people, when you come across them, they'll they'll tell you, oh, well, you work for Baswa, you're, you're a union rep. People still struggle with the concept that actually these are two separate organisations. Lots of um, options. If you do join Baswa and we do have reduced fees, this is where I turn into my sales pitch. We do have reduced fees for students um, and all that detail is in the presentation. Um, those reduced fees also stay with you for your first year or two in employment. So, you know, it's, it, it is worth joining earlier rather than later, not only to access all of the um, the student hub information that I've put links into, um, but actually, because we stay with you throughout your career, you do get that reduced rate then um, as you as you move into your, your first, first role. 
The SWU membership fee is separate and is on top of your BASWA membership. You can be a member of BASWA without needing to join the Social Worker Union and you can be a member of BASWA and be a member of an alternative union. So they're not, you know, it's not an either or, okay? One of the joys of the Social Work Union, just to say, is that we do have um, campaign funding linked with the union. So if there's something that you feel really passionate about, either in your social work placement, within your student role, whatever it might be, that you actually think, or maybe you're an active member of a branch, of a local branch. And I know we've got people here tonight that are from across the country, not just Greater Manchester. If if there's a campaign theme, so for instance, some, some areas were very much interested in the area of food poverty. And some of you may have um, heard of Dominic Waters, who's a BASWA member, who was our student rep on the committee. Dominic actually accessed funding through the Social Work Union to run that food poverty campaign and has worked quite closely with, with the union. So there's, fa there's funding there if you want to, if you're particularly passionate about a particular campaign activity, you've got the ability to tap into some funding. In terms of what does BASWA give to you? Well, I've just said it's 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 in terms of your your independent identity at the voice of social work. We're out there constantly, day in day out, challenging some of the narrative around social work, trying to explain to the the population what social work is, the value we bring to our societies, that that you know what it is that we're actually doing um, for the people that we work for. Because it, we know it's misunderstood. We know that the media only ever focus on one tiny little bit of social work, and so one of the really kind of key areas that we focus on is trying to educate population in terms of what social work really is and what value we bring. Um, but we also then, we have advice and representation alongside the social work union for you, you get your advice and representation. So just this morning, I had somebody ringing me, asking me um, around, I'm thinking of deregistering, but I don't want to give up on social work, but what are my options? What can I do? Well, you've got another social worker at the end of a phone to have that conversation with you to actually talk through. Well, have you considered some of these options? And you know, so every time you ring through or you're in contact with BASWA, if it's in relation to advice and representation or it's a social work union, it's a qualified social worker you'll be speaking to. That's quite key because that's not the same everywhere. In terms of what, and I know I'm speaking really quickly here, but I'll try and get through the whole presentation. Um, what else do you get out of BASWA? Well, you get opportunities to network and influence. So tonight being the perfect example, thanks to Stacey, Sarah and other members of, of the Greater Manchester branch, this event's been put on. It's an opportunity for everybody to connect. But there's, this is just one event. There are daily events um, put on through BASWA that you can see on our events page. Um, there's opportunities to get actively involved. So in terms of, for instance, the thematic groups, we've got a variety there. They're just some of them listed. Um, those thematic groups will directly influence government policy because we will lead on consultation responses. So if you feel quite passionate about a particular area of policy, government policy that, that you know, you feel perhaps the voice isn't being heard, you've got active opportunities. Particularly, I think you'll find as you go through your career, and certainly it was a source of frustration for me, which is what led me to join Baswell many moons ago, was as you go through your career, there might be times where you feel like, OK, so I do this job day in, day out. I can hear that everybody around me that I work with thinks A, B and C, but I don't get a sense that the rest of the world or the rest of the population or the government or the powers that be really understand what my experience is here and what the experience of the people we work with is. And actually, that's where your opportunity comes in to actually feed those experiences up through and actually actively influence um, government policy, etc. And local policy, because some of these networks might be around connecting in with your local principal social workers. It might be around connecting in with your, um, your integrated care boards. And we do a lot of that with BASWA. So local influencing, whether it's through your branches or the wider wider um, organisation, uh, uh, you know, it's brilliant for that. Um, again, we, we network with lots of different organisations, not just government, but Social Work England. Um, we have lots of national campaigns. I'll get onto those in a second. Um, and we have media opportunities. So BASWA members who feel able to and want to be out there sharing their experience. Obviously, confidentiality is key, but actually trying to articulate, which is what we need. What is it day to day like in the role? Well, we can send you on media training. We can get you out there so that actually you can share some of that. Um, in terms of development, 
lots and lots of CPD opportunities, lots of training, lots of free training or training at a significantly reduced cost if you join. Um, we've got the professional support service, which is a coaching service one to one, um, which again is part of your membership. And that covers a wide variety of what it is you want to focus on um, in terms of your professional development. Or it might be that maybe you're experiencing some difficulties in the workplace. You want to talk that through with somebody outside who is just going to be a little bit more objective around some of that discussion. Um, we've got the monthly PSW magazine. Uh, we've got. Uh, yeah, there's there's a whole host we've got weekly email bulletins that come out that'll keep you connected with some of that wider work that's going on and um, but also flagging events that might be coming up or opportunities to engage in consultations and we've got the mentoring scheme now this is my particular uh favorite thing because um i i, I manage the, the mentoring scheme at the moment for Vazwa. and what it is effectively um it's for england members so just in case there's anybody here from the other nations this is purely for england members we run a monthly open forum that you can pop into um, and we have one to one sessions a little bit similar to the PSS. The difference is the mentoring scheme is focused solely around either supporting you into your first role, um, whether it's because you're newly qualified or maybe you're returning to a career in social work or maybe you qualified abroad and it's the first time you come to work in the UK and you're looking for that support with applications, interview process, etc. We'll match you with a mentor who already works or has experience of working in the area that you're looking to move into. So you'll have on online one to one um, sessions with those mentors. So really helpful in terms of it's one thing learning the academic background to, to what, you know, and you've been on placement, but it might well be that your placement wasn't in an area of work that you actually want your first role to be in. Um, so actually finding out what is it like um, from, from people who are working in there and who can actually say to you, OK, well, I can guarantee in interviews you're likely to need to cover A, B and C. Um, and also, I think for a lot of people, there's, there's issues there in terms of how to really showcase your skills and your knowledge. It doesn't come naturally to a lot of us around, you know, trying to really kind of spotlight what you're going to bring to an organisation. And a mentor will do some of that with you. They'll support you confidence wise to make sure that you're actually giving the best of yourself when you get into that interview. Professional identity, I've covered a lot of this already. Um, We've touched on the PCF. We're very proud of the PCF. We're, it, we are the custodians for the PCF um, and it is currently under review. Um, I think we've commissioned Bath University to, to, to review that. Um, it's I find it absolutely amazing that whenever I go to in-person events, the full first thing that disappears off those little desks that we have where we, we have all our merchandise that we're, we're, we're giving it. The PCF goes every time. It's the first thing that people make a beeline for. That says a lot about how people value it. Um, We've got our code of ethics, you know, again, this is something that when you're in the workplace, also when you're in placement, having a code of ethics to come back as a professional and say, I'm being asked to do A, B or C, or I need to justify a decision that I'm making in terms of maybe you're challenging a funding decision for an individual you're working with. You've got your code of ethics there to come back as a sound basis for some of that decision making and you can reference that. Um, we do a lot of collaboration with employers, education providers, providers etc. And it is that collective professional identity, peer support networks, etc. Basel campaigns. So you'll be glad to know we um, have had various campaigns in terms of student bursary. I think it was the, the Welsh one has been successful in that the, the bursary has been reviewed and increased. Um, and the England um, campaign in terms of the bursary, I think come January time, I think there's going to be a renewed focus around that, not just in terms of um, increasing it, but also the access to it, making it easier to access. So campaigning around that, campaigning around things like um, the mileage rates. So we continue to focus on that in terms of actually for some social workers, depending on where they live, um, it actually costs them to undertake the role because of the amount of miles they're putting in and we're currently being paid, social workers are being paid a mileage rate that was agreed back in 2011. So, and we have continually championed and, and written to government, et cetera, in terms of trying to get that increased and reviewed. Lots of other campaigns in there. I'm just keeping my eye on the time. <laughs> we're nearly there and I do want to hand back to Stacey. Uh, again, on the Basel website, lots of information around these campaigns, the 80-20 relationship-based practice, that cuts across children, families and adults, and it's very much around promoting social workers having the time to build relationships with the individuals they work with and reducing the time spent in, in front of a computer. Um, I'm just going to move through. Student ambassador scheme. If, if you hear nothing else, 
hear this one today. The Student Ambassador Scheme is actually open right now um, and they only ever have it for a short window, but it's open right now uh, for new applicants. So that's where basically if you're you're you decided that you do want to become a BASWA member, you get a free membership. You There's a variety of different um, goodies that you get as part of that student ambassador role, but ultimately it's about you then agreeing to kind of be the the, the voice, the representative of BASWA within your your um, your university or you know whichever setting you're actually in. There's a few asks we'll have. I've got them listed there. You can read them afterwards when I send it out to you. We've got a student and NQSW group. Um, I've put information in about the student hub. Um, there's lots and lots of, of activity happening um, as part of those peer, peer support groups. We've also got the Neurodivergent Social Worker SIG and Student Subgroup. And there's your PCF, so you can always cut and paste out the presentation and have that as on your desktop. Um, and then these are just a variety of, of different um, CPD and professional development um, opportunities that you've got. So we've got podcasts, we've got taught skills program. There's a multitude of different things in there. Take your time to have a look afterwards. Um, I've covered that. I won't go into that one again. Covered that. And just got a QR code if you if you decide today that you do want to sign up. Um, yeah. And then a load of resources in the final slide. So I'm going to stop sharing and bang on time. I'm going to hand back to Stacey unless there's any questions. Good work, Denise. Um, <laughs> Have you tell us done that one before? <laughs> perfectly timed. Um, I think Helen had just popped a comment um, in the chat that might be useful um, for you around the bursary campaign. Is that she's saying that you're not all you're not eligible for the disabled students allowance at the same time. Um, so that might be That's something really to helpful, take Helen. forward. Yeah. I'll take um, a note of that and I'll pass it on to my colleagues who are kind of leading in terms of the, the, the bursary campaign. So I'll, I'll pick up on that. Thank you. OK, um, and I'm just going to stick the um, feedback link in the chat again um, for anybody that's not completed it. And now I will hand over to Stacey to close the show. <laughs> thank you. Um, yeah, just an absolutely massive thank you for um, speaking today to all the speakers, um, Lisa, Vicky, Rachel, and Barry, Pam, and Denise. Um, I've learned so much, and it's been so informative and thought provoking. I've just literally got something from everybody. Um, so, massive thank you for that. Um, and it's also great to see so many students here from different pathways as well as different universities. I think we've got people from all over the country. So, that's um, been amazing and I've seen a lot of um, like a step up to the apprenticeships and BAs so um, yeah covering all the pathways as well um, and I just want to say thank you to the Greater Manchester branch because as it's been said this was my kind of I'm, I'm a real advocate for students um, and they've absolutely ran with the idea of a student event and all these um, guest speakers have been brought together so thank you to the Greater Manchester um, branch for for this. Um, and then thank you to Baswa as well for the support that they are giving to students putting on events like this. I can um, speak as Denise said for the um, Baswa ambassador scheme. So I'm a Baswa ambassador and it's um, helped me so much as a student, so much networking has been involved, um, support. I'm always being asked for my um, ideas and to get involved in things. So if anyone's interested in being a student ambassador, I would highly recommend that. Um, and then we've also got the Baswa Pay Support um, Forum we were on um, Vice Chair of as well. We meet the last Thursday of every month and it's open to all Baswa students and, um, and uh, newly qualified students as well. And it's really informal drop in. Um, so anyone who wants to come along to that, please do. It's on the event page every month for um, Baswa students. Um, yeah, so there's just a reminder that the questionnaire is there and I've just popped on our Twitter as well. So I keep that updated of any events that are coming forward. So I've just put that there. Um, and then the um, you can add your email to the questionnaire as well and be involved in any future events. And we'd love some ideas of what everyone wants to see moving forward. Um, yeah, and I think we're just on time for finishing. So well done to everyone.
Yay! <laughs> Perfect. Look at that. Um, we knew we were pushing it, squeezing so many people in, but I think it's been really, really worthwhile hearing from all the different people. Um, thank you, everybody, for joining us. Thank you, jo Julia, for joining us as well. Thank you to all the speakers. Um, and thank you to Stacey. What a great idea. And I'm really glad that we've been able to do it and that we've been joined by so many people from all over. Um, it's been brilliant. Um, and just to echo the Greater Manchester branch has been it has been absolutely great, really, really supportive um, as a new chair as well. So it's been great to see. Um, and I guess we'll say good night now. Thank you all very much. Um, great night. Thanks for to... organising it, Sarah and Stacey. I think Denise said she's going to share her slides. So those will um, go around so you'll be able to follow some of those links as well and have, spend some time on the stuff that she, she shared there as well. It's really important and interesting stuff. Um, and good Sarah, are you able to check students? with the other speakers if they're happy to share? Then I'll I'll get their stuff out at the same time as well. Absolutely. Yeah, I can sort that out. And good luck to all of those students that are not at Manmet that I won't see. Um, good luck to you all. Um, enjoy your journey um, and then just embrace the challenge. Um, we need you to stick with it. So make the most of, of your training because we, we want you to stay in the workforce. That's really important. Good night, everyone. <laughs>